would like, uh, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a Memorial Day edition of Real Estate Realities with the Rebel Broker. My name is Robert Whitelaw, and I am the Rebel Broker, licensed real estate broker in the state of California, member of the National Association of Real Tours. But please don't hold that against me. I hope it has been a great weekend for all of you. I know for, for probably a huge chunk of you, today is a holiday. I hope all of you today is a holiday. Um, so you may or may not be listening on actual Memorial Day. If you are, I'd encourage you to go out and take advantage of the day, but also use it for its intended purpose to remember those who have fallen in service of our country, and well, in service of the United States, assuming that's your country. Two good ways to do that. Go to a uh, cemetery to pay respect to those who've fallen. Uh, another option is to uh, donate funds to any to the to the uh, charity of your choice that takes care of uh, folks who have been widowed or orphaned uh, by the loss of a loved one in combat. Uh, that's something that uh, uh, I think is important to do. So hopefully you're able to take some time out today to uh, to make some sort of remembrance. Uh, kind of a, you know, boy, I, I what I would like to do is a good news show. I mean, the last, we actually had one. It's, it had been an awfully long time uh, when we started to see numbers that actually looked good relating to construction. We'll get into, uh, you know, the always upbeat zero hedge here in a second. Um, really asking the question, how is this not a recession that we're in? Now, we've painted some pictures with different financial data that we've looked at. Um, now, before we jump into the meat here, uh, just a reminder on how to get in touch with me, head on over to the website, therebelbroker.com. From there, you can click on contact in the menu bar. Send along any ideas, suggestions, observations, or questions that you might have. Uh, also, you'll be able to click the big red button at the top of the page titled Take the Survey to Support the Show. When you do that, you're not just supporting the show. You're also entering yourself into the drawing for a $50 Amazon gift card. It's just my way of thanking people for going to the trouble of jumping through the hoops of, of supporting the show by providing some demographic information. Now, when you click that button, you'll be asked your email address. You'll be asked that twice. Make sure to use the same one both times. And then you'll be asked to answer some demographic style questions. There's a handful of them. And in doing so, you are dramatically helping the show. It's a way for uh, folks who at some point will want to advertise on the show to get an idea of the demographics of the people who listen. That is the purpose of it. Um, and as you know, if you've been listening for a long time, one of my goals with the show is to get it on a paying basis. I promise not to overwhelm the show with ads. I definitely have a plan to keep it thin in terms of the amount of time spent uh, advertising. But that's how you support a show. So trying to move forward with that and your help is appreciated. Okay. So we've talked about the, the auto industry before in terms of just how much debt there is. Uh, it's, it's, in the, it's billions of dollars. It's, it's, it's a huge bubble. We've talked about it in, in concert with the uh, student loan bubble and all these other kinds of wonderful things. In fact, the number on that is 1.2 trillion. Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure what the what the uh, student loan bubble was at the last time we talked. Uh, I know it is at least 1.31 trillion because 1.3 was the subprime peak when we were doing the loans, and that that was the peak that it reached. And the, the student loans have surpassed where we were at in terms of um, uh, in term, terms of indebtedness. Um, Another little piece of data here, one in three new loans being written to borrowers, subprime, 33%, a full third, um, which is bad. Uh, I, you know, anytime you're, you're lending that much money to folks who are subprime, 
If anything goes nuts, we find ourselves falling back into that scenario of trying to guess what they're going to stop paying first, what they're going to get behind on first. Uh, and mortgages are right up there at the top. Uh, it, 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 it tends to be number two in terms of what gets ignored. Um, and, and that should concern anyone. Um, let's see here. So one of the big news items, uh, this actually came out from the Wall Street Journal, Journal, is that Ford is planning to cut its global workforce by 10%. Um, that should be a concern. Um, Ford is a gigantic employer. Uh, what's interesting is, is that at the same time that we've got this crazy uh, amount of, of lending in the automobile industry in terms of car loans, we are seeing big drops in in what Ford's expectations are in terms of what kind of workforce they're going to be able to support. Uh, we have near record high inventories of 3.9 million vehicles with demand going down. So clearly that's the reason for uh, this particular move. Um, and why we care about employment is because in order to be able to purchase a home, qualify for a loan, you need to have a job. Uh, if we start to see unemployment tanking, uh, that could be a bad thing. Uh, well, would, <laughs> that would be a bad thing. Uh, now, link this with some other things that are going on. At a time when we're seeing all this indebtedness, at a time when we're seeing indicators that the employment sector could suffer, what else do we see? Home equity loans are at an all-time high. They are they are uh, in huge demand right now. A lot of it is feeding uh, renovations. Folks are back into renovating homes. Uh, but the bottom line is once that work is done, the, you have the results of it, but you now have a far more encumbered home and you don't have the cash. So uh, that, again, heaps onto the debt portfolio or the, the debt profile uh, of the average person. And that concerns me as well, because remember, we've already talked about the choices people make when they get into an indebted situation that they can't really handle. And this this final element of it or the final thing you need to watch out for that would precipitate something like this, I think, is a threat to employment. And this seems like the first indicator of that. Now, uh, interestingly enough, one of the things that's that's kind of lucky in my business is I get to talk to an, talk to an awful lot of different folks, um, and when I start to see things in in normally very robust businesses, right, particularly high tech, I have tons of high tech around me. I talk to people from Google, Apple, Intel, Facebook, um, you know, so I, I get to talk to folks who are involved in these high tech companies, and I can get an idea from them of what's going on in terms of employment. Now, remember, one thing that you can't dispute that isn't a rumor is just how much cash these companies are stockpiling. And that's an in, that's an indicator of concern, right? When you are holding on to all of that cash, normally when a business is very cash heavy, it's because they're concerned that something's gonna happen where they're gonna have to dip into it. Uh, you can go ahead and Google how many billions of dollars Apple has. I, it's, it's hundreds of billions at this at this point, if I'm not mistaken. Google, same thing. Uh, most of the top companies in the country are stockpiling cash. And that worries me too, because why are you doing that? What are, what are the main reasons for doing that? Um, normally, you'd see more reinvestment to, aimed at expansion or growing your business or something, and that's not happening. And finally, one more element I wanted to throw out there is pensions. Uh, we've talked about pensions before, and the concern is this is a huge liability and even some very successful communities. Dallas, for instance. Dallas has seen tons of growth. Dallas has, Dallas has t- tons more residents, so their their tax rolls are, are steamrolling across the, the, the state, and yet they are having huge unfunded liability issues with their pensions. Um, A new report from the Hoover Institution written by senior fellow Joshua Raw titled Hidden Debt, Hidden Deficits, How Pension Promises Are Consuming State and Local Budgets uh, lays out the overall severity of our public pension problem. Uh, and, And why do I bring up pensions? It's a systematic indebtedness that 
is linked directly to the government. Governments tend to be the ones that provide pensions for firefighters, policemen, all, everybody who works for the government. And that's a concern because it, it's it's not just the fact that these things are underfunded. It's the fact that if there's a rush on it, which is happening, uh, that can be one of those dominoes we've talked about that can negatively impact the economy. And it's just another angle of attack, right? We've talked about so many different things that could be an issue that push the economy down. And the pensions are, are a big one. Now, in it, this raw fellow, uh, senior fellow, uh, let's see. Part of the study, Rob reviewed in detail 649 state, county, and local pension systems in the United States and ranked them based on funding status and impact on local budgets. He f- what he found was a hidden taxpayer debt burden in the form of a of underfunded pensions liabilities totaling $3.8 trillion. Now, that's not – that's separate all by itself. So for, we've got $3.8 trillion in unfunded liabilities for pensions. We've got indebtedness – on uh, cars for 1.2 billion, we've got student loans that are at least 1.31 uh, trillion, and I actually think that's closer to four trillion now, um, based on some other stuff I was reading last week. And that's nuts. However, what's crazy? If you go back and do some math, and use a uh, a bit of common sense. And this this uh, senior fellow at the Hoover Institution brings this up. He comes down with a number of 3.8. But if you apply some common sense, quote unquote, math, as opposed to pension math, you end up with 8 billion in terms of the total indebtedness. Um, Let's talk about some of the worst cases here. Uh, at the state level, it should come as a little surprise that uh, Illinois is the very top of the list for the worst funded pension system in the country, followed by, let's see, Il- let's see, it's Illinois, Kentucky, and all of these guys are overvaluing their market. So there's this, and I'll, I'll Pinterest this graph so you can see what I'm talking about, but they have their stated value and their actual market value. And every single one of these guys is overestimating uh, the value of their pensions. So as I mentioned, Illinois is first, Kentucky, New Jersey, Arizona, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Mississippi, Massachusetts, Michigan, Alabama, Colorado, Rhode Island, Kansas, Alaska, Vermont, North Dakota, Maryland, Louisiana, New Hampshire, Indiana, Nevada, New Mexico, Texas, and Georgia. Um, Now, why do I, what what do we do with this? Um, According to this data, the worst funded state pensions will continue to see their underfunded liabilities continue to grow as they would, uh, as they would have to dedicate anywhere from 15 to 25 percent of their entire revenue base just to maintain their current funding levels, which, of course, is not likely. Now, here's one other thing that will exacerbate this, that will likely make this worse. When folks get to the point where they're ready to, to go on their pension, they can either take it as, at a lump sum up front uh, that is reduced. Um, this is a reduced amount, or they can take it as a you know a monthly distribution kind of a thing. Now, in the case in Texas is because so many folks are convinced that the pensions are going to go insolvent. They are making the they're making it happen faster by opting for the cash buyout at the front end. Uh, so that itself could cause a lot of these communities to take a hit. Now what do we do with this, right? What's what's the action that we take? Well, first, I think we figure out how affected your local economy would be with these kinds of things. Obviously, if you're any of the states listed at the top of this list, and you know, all, nearly all of them um, are, are having a problem. I mean, this, this isn't, this isn't um, a unique thing. But in terms of what will happen down the road, well, if this falls onto uh, the taxpayer, which it, if they do end up having to continue to fund this, they're, they're not going to tell these pension recipients, you're out of luck, no money for you. Uh, taxpayers are, will be put on the uh, hook for all of this stuff, no matter what happens, whether there's some sort of a federal intervention bailout thing uh, or whether it's a state thing, and, and you will bear the brunt of that. And it could have 
variety of different effects, right? If they print more money, it's the invisible tax. Uh, it's the tax that makes that dollar in your pocket worth less tomorrow than it is today, right? For for X number of dollars printed, it reduces your the value of the dollar in your pocket by X amount, right? That's inflation. That's when you've got more money being pumped into the system. So the volume of dollars goes up, which means the value of each individual dollar goes down. The other thing would be a direct assessment. Uh, and what would be interesting there would be where does, who would be hit by that? And in all honesty, given where I am in California, um, it wouldn't surprise me if this somehow gets linked to property taxes. So, there, there's something to be enthusiastic about. Uh, does it mean that you shouldn't invest in any of these states? Not necessarily, uh, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if if the goal here uh, ends up being reached on the backs of of property owners. Um, you know, I'm I'm not sure what usually happens when a pension goes broke, particularly when it is looking like it's going to be such a widespread problem. But my guess would be this, that some portion of it is a, is reduced by impacting the benefits to those who are supposed to receive them. Uh, and then the rest of it would be on the backs of taxpayers in the form of either a federal bailout or a, or a local bailout, um, which I think would have a dramatically negative effect on markets in general, uh, on the economy in general. I, I don't I don't think these would be good things for us. Um, on the upside, in terms of what 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 are the smart positions to be in? I, I think that rental properties are probably the place to be for things like that. I, I, and again, this is something I'm not sure that we can lay down a groundwork for. But I'd like to think that a certain amount of protection would be offered by having ownership in real property, right? Because uh, while there would be a negative effect on the value of the dollar, uh, if you have real estate and you've got it on a 30 year fixed loan, um, you know, when, when inflation happens, interest rates typically go up um, because the dollar is worth less, right? We've had this conversation before. Uh, and it's really very logical. You know, it, it's one of those things where if you have a thousand dollars and you want to make money on it and you want to make money on it by lending it, then the very first thing you need to do is make sure you're lending it for more than the rate of inflation. Right. So if you know that the rate of inflation is 3% and you rent and that's yearly and you loan that money, well, you know, you need to make more than 3% on that money in a year, right? Because in, in one year, if you only get 3%, that's like being given the same amount of money back. In other words, if today I can buy a thousand dollars worth of widgets and inflation is 3%, then when I reach 365 days from now, I can't buy the same number of widgets with the money I lent, right? So it's about purchasing power. Maybe you've decided that So you want to make whatever inflation is plus more to compensate you for the loss of use of the money. After all, you could have put that in stocks. You could have invested it in real estate. You could have chosen some other investment avenue that would net you 5, 8, 10% or something along those lines. A loan like this, perhaps as a being a lender, is supposed to be more secure. So you're trading a little bit of interest that you would make for that. So... So that's the logical thing that happens, right? When the value of the dollar goes down, then you need, as a lender, you want to make sure you are being compensated, not only to keep the value of the money you've lent, but then to also make some money on it, right? So in this scenario, everyone gets negatively hit. The folks who get their pensions suddenly have less money that they can spend in the economy. They suddenly have left less money to manage whatever debts they continue to have, such as a mortgage or anything else. We may see something like this equal more folks trying to sell their home and downsize simply because the, the economics of it don't work for them anymore. They had planned getting X amount on their pension, and now they're not going to get that. Well, and you can say the same to a certain degree – to the rest of the population, depending on the solution that's used. If we all get this sort of national assessment for pensions, my feeling is they'll try to do it invisibly. I don't know. They're not going to go around and say, okay, now everyone has to pay an additional additional 1%. My guess is if that at the federal level, they would simply print more money to pay it off, which would just make everyone's dollars worth less which has the same net effect, except now not only have they reduced the income of the pensioners, but they've also made everything that the pensioners would buy more expensive by printing up more money 
to pay the pensioners. So it becomes this kind of vicious cycle. So what though so basically what we're doing here is adding we've got this board now with index cards of things to worry about whether you're talking about changes to lending practices relating to focusing more on subprime borrowers or changing credit ratings or the amount of debt that people are incurring because of their car or the amount of debt people are incurring because of their student loans or the amount of debt people are incurring because of their HELOCs. Um, Now we've got this sort of institutional pension problem and I think that's one more big shining card to put on that board and be concerned about. Now, here's here's the crux of it as well. One thing I've been looking for is a ray of sunshine in any of the things we've talked about. Now, I had thought it looked like we were going to, to see some building uh, at, at, at levels that allow people to get entry-level homes. And it, it while there are signs that that may happen, we're going to have to keep our eyes open. The actual data of permits and construction and everything else that would indicate we're going to see that within this calendar year is not where we would want it to be, uh, and at least not in the way to to provide a relief to a lot of folks who are in my market who are shopping for a home or trying to be able to shop for a home. But at the same time, we talked about some things last week relating to actually inventory is down, the number of buyers is theoretically down. I have seen a dip in the number of people actively looking for real estate in my area. Um, You know, I usually get a certain number of queries per month and I'm finding I'm getting fewer. We saw a bit of an uptick at the end of last year and I shared that with you here. But right now, I would normally expect to see a ramp up. We're at the end of May and... I saw an uptick in January and February, and then things have been declining since then. My argument would be that we still have enough demand to get homes sold that are in the inventory, but it's so lackluster. We, we get this kind of false intensity because we have this weirdly low inventory that is... Uh, the only number that it, 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 it gives it an impressive feel is the fact that the low number of buyers outnumbers the number of homes in inventory. So again, this all feels very artificial. This all feels uh, kind of kind of artificially out of balance in a way that feels a lot like last time, where we we all know what happened then. And that's not something we want to see a repeat of. Um, and if I'm trying, if I want to try to give you any strategies on how to manage this uncertainty, because I think that's really where it has to come down. I, there, there's. I'm not saying everything's going to crash within the next few months, but I'm also saying not everything's going to go through the roof in the next few months. But I think that there is a enough data on the ground that we've covered that caution is probably a good way to go. So for me. I think what that equals is giving myself a little bit more of a margin on my investments for me to be able to manage a downturn. Now, if a downturn happens like it happened last time, rents didn't tend to get affected. In fact, rents grew as people gave up their mortgages and moved into rental properties, which increased the demand on rental properties. Um, the interesting difference this time, though, is that we have a whole lot more apartments that are that have been constructed and that are just getting finished, at least in my market. Not going to be true everywhere. Um, but usually what you see is is folks preferring to try to not do the apartment, trying to do single family residential. Um but we'll have to see how that goes. I, I, it's going to be interesting to see what the first shoe to drop is and how it gets managed. Um, but I still think that the best place for to have your money, if you've got it in something, is going to be something like real estate. And I realize that's very self-serving and what I do is real estate. Um, so that's obviously my personal bias. But I, in reading some of these other articles as it relates to the to the stock market, even the news there isn't good. Talk about things being dramatically overvalued versus what they should be uh, is now getting pretty common. So in terms of where to put your money in a way that it's going to uh, at least hold its value in terms of a thing that's desirable, people always need a place to sleep. Uh, so I think that that's probably a great position to be in, even if you need to take a more investment 
defensive style position uh, if you believe that really bad things are going to happen. All right, folks. I hate it. I hate it when I when I end the show on this ambiguous note of just here's bad stuff and good luck. Uh, hopefully, we can come up with some decent strategies as we see actual events occur and and get some some good insights into just rationally looking at what happens. Um, there are now so many different things that could potentially blow up uh, that I think we kind of have to wait to see which one that is. And in the meantime. Just make smart decisions. Does, I don't think it means you stop looking at at real estate to invest in. Um, I think it means that you just uh, approach it with a cautious strategy, that you go in there understanding that you need to build in a little bit more elbow room for you to potentially accept less in rents or if you are going to be flipping. I think that what we talked about last week in terms of builders wanting to flip fast rather than expensive – is a valid one, and I think it's also a strategy that you should be embracing if you're a flipping uh, person. If you go in there and you and, and you rebuild homes, uh, I would not remodel those to ultimate luxury levels. I, I think that the smart move is for you to, and that's always been the goal, right? But uh, but with some rehabs, you you maybe take a little bit longer. I think emphasizing getting those things turned around as fast as possible is a rational strategy at this point. Uh, and hopefully, you know, that'll work out for you. All right, folks, as always, the hope is that in spending your valuable time with me, you at least walk away with some interesting things to think about, or maybe things that get you thinking in a way you weren't thinking before that'll help you form a great strategy to weather whatever comes around the corner over the next year. Thanks again for listening, everybody. And I'll talk to y'all next time.